I'm uh, taking the opposite tack of technology. I have no slides. I'm a, I'm a dinosaur. So um, I have these paper, uh, these paper things in my hand that I might refer to. I have attention deficit disorder, so you know, um, if there were pretty things up on slides, I just get distracted and stare at them with you. Uh, I, am a, I am a physician. I work in Guelph, Ontario. Um, also a, <coughs> a scholar of, um, a budding scholar of this literature and cultural studies at McMaster University. And I study the representations of pain in Christian literature. Um, but I want to tell you some anecdotes. You may wonder why uh, I'm here today. This particular panel has a large amount of scientific uh, content uh, for the TEDx talk today. And um, you may wonder, how did a family doctor get on the bill? Well, I came here a couple months ago. I was invited by John Panavir, who's a PhD uh, at Western. And I was invited because I'm a poet, but also because I'm a medical doctor. And the bill that particular day was science and poetry. And so I was allowed in the door based on my problems as a medical doctor. But um, I'm sure you know that most physicians actually aren't scientists. And that's going to become ironic as my talk unfolds. I'm going to tell you another anecdote. This one involves my marriage. And it was, uh, in, it was in 2003. I was in Halifax, Nova Scotia, just beyond the Northwest Army. I was at a uh, Commissioner Bose office. I was trying to get a marriage license with my wife. I was sitting in front of this uh, middle-aged lady who was, wanted to write down her occupation so that we could get married. That was what was required, and I could still be seeing her tomorrow. And so in response to her question as to what I did, I thought, well, I just finished medical school, and I'm doing residency. Um, so I blurted out very quickly to fill the silence position. And my wife, who's much cannier than me, uh, waited for me to inevitably pull up bite. And uh, she had a big smile on her face. She just finished a Master's of Science at Dalhousie University. She smiled and she said, scientist. I felt like it was a little bit like looking at kids and what do you do for a living? I'm sad to grow up. I want to be a doctor. My wife forevermore won the battle of romantic career choice. I could have at the time said poet, but forevermore, I'm a physician and she is a scientist. I have another anecdote for you. It gets a little bit more into the meat of the talk today. Consider Rene Descartes, a modern day Rene Descartes. He's a neurophysiologist and he's in the burn unit. The health sciences here in London. Rene is a neurophysiologist, but for some reason he has a 20% burn, surface area burn on his body. He's on the burn unit and he knows science. He knows how nerve A connects to neuron B. He knows how a stimulus affects a nociceptor in the periphery. He knows how that signal goes up through his brain. He knows there are no transmitters involved in the transmission of that signal. He knows the areas of the brain that are responsible for the reception and the interpretation of the feeling and the cognizance and experience of it. But Rene knows something else. Rene also knows he has a problem of meaning. Because a few years ago, Rene lost his job. Global financial crisis. He was a private researcher for a private company. He ended up in a roomy house here in London, and uh, he turned a state tax to alcohol for a solace. He had a cigarettes. He had a cigarette in his mouth. One night he passed out, burned him in the bed, and uh, because the building codes weren't enforced in this roomy house, sprinklers didn't go on. Maybe there were no sprinklers, and so he has the burn, and he's on the burn unit, and neuron A leading to neuron B does not help him in his bed. He has a problem with meaning, not a problem with neurology. So why am I telling you these anecdotes? I'm telling you these anecdotes to present to you that there's a different way of knowing. There's a different way to produce and disseminate knowledge. And perhaps you've heard of the discipline of narrative medicine. It's something that was largely uh, created by Rita Sharon, who's a PhD in Henry James and also an internist at Columbia University. But it's not my intention to even define narrative medicine today, nor to pretend that I know Rita personally. It's simply to enact narrative medicine in the form of my 
presentation because I truly do feel that there is a problem with the way we treat patients with pain and the problem is done to patients based on the scientific, the purely scientific view that's applied to them. So let me define my terms. What do I mean when I say pain? Well, there's a local Western connection. Do you believe this? There was a fellow by the name of Harold Mursky, who was a psychiatrist here in London, and he defined pain for our age. In 1979, he created the definition for the fledgling International Association for the Study of Pain. He wrote it. And the short version is, pain is a negative sensory and emotional experience, experienced in terms of, experienced in terms of damage. That word damage is key. I don't disagree that pain is a negative sensation. But the connector to damage and negative really becomes formative in what I'm going to say. They're linked together and they're inextricable in the medical view. That is the codified definition that we have for pain. So if that's pain, I need to tell you that what I'm talking about today is also chronic pain. And the National Institute of Health defines chronic pain as pain which lasts longer than three months. And that, there's more finicky definitions, but that's going to be the definition that's going to suffice for today. And now I want to tell you the stakes of pain in Canada, because there are significant stakes. It's estimated that 20% of Canadians will experience chronic pain in their lifetime, a number that's only going to go up as we age, and hopefully we will. Of course, rising rates of obesity and other things are going to maybe pull down our number, but a recent Ipsos Reed study was done. 69% of physicians who have a significant, family physicians who have a significant amount of palliative care practice and also pain practice estimate that um, chronic pain is undertreated in Canada. The cost of the Canadian economy, estimated a few years ago by the Canadian Pain Society, is 50 to $60 billion a year by chronic pain. And I have maybe a shocking piece of information for you. It was certainly shocking. I was talking to Dr. Jim Ducharme, who's a um, pain specialist in the emergency department at uh, McMaster University, a world-renowned expert in the management of pain in the emergency department. And he pointed me to a study done in the Archives of Internal Medicine in 2015. Now, that was a Cochrane review, and I'm also not going to go into the nuances of that. But a Cochrane review is basically a compilation of all the previous research that has been done that meets a certain standard on a particular topic. The upshot of it is, they concluded in 2015, this year, there's no evidence to support the use of opiates in chronic pain over the, over the month of a year. I found that shocking because that is commonly done. Opiates are used to prescribe for patients with chronic pain. They did, of course, find a dose-dependent relationship between the amount of So what, are, what am I saying today? Am I saying that doctors are a menace? I am, actually, a little bit. And am I, am I saying there's a, there's a problem with chronic pain in Canada? Both of those things, both of those things are, are really obvious. Let me tell you what I'm saying based on who I am. I'm not a specialist in chronic pain. I'm a family doctor. Um, I don't see chronic pain patients every day, every minute of every day. And I'm also not an expert in the demographics of pain. What I am is a scholar, a budding scholar, in English literature who reads shelves of Canadian literature in order to find alternate representations of pain. And I'll tell you what I've concluded as the possible nature of the problem that we all share. And the nature of that is that we all use destructive metaphors to describe pain. Now, before I get too deep into that, I'll just say it could be true that we lack the perfect drug to treat pain, and that's our, that's our plight as people in pain. It could be that we lack the perfect intervention as people in pain, but I would suggest to you that it's the path suggested by our very same destructive metaphors that makes us think of drug intervention. So what do I mean by destructive metaphors? It's simple. You've all been in this clinic. Let's pretend it's my clinic. But you've all been in this particular clinic, I'm sure. For those who in, in the audience who are suffering from chronic pain or those in the audience who are suffering from acute injuries sometime. You go into the doctor, you say it hurts somewhere. The doctor listens, hopefully. And he says to you, and I would say to you, describe your pain to me. 
And what words would you use? You'd use words like crushing, burning, stabbing, ripping. Those are the only words. There are others like it, but those are the only use, words used that we have as people to describe the human experience. They are metaphors, inevitably, of damage, and they are, they are also metaphors of weapons. So this is not a new thing. This is something that's been known for a long time. So I'm not pointing to you anything that I myself have concluded. I have concluded it, but it's not my original conclusion. It's been known since the 1940s, and Elaine Scarry popularized it in 1985 with her book, The Body of Pain. It's a beautiful book. And since Scarry's book, there have been, in response, more positive ways to look at pain. So the humanities in particular has looked at other ways to frame outside of a hegemonic negative frame. And we have now things that I'll just mention and I won't explain, but there are ways. There's Levinasian philosophy. There's intersubjectivity. But why should we care about these negative metaphors? Well, we should care because we're all locked into them. If we only have a negative way to talk about pain, then how can our output I would suggest to you that that is the fundamental problem that we have. I doubt that very many people in the audience listening to this talk can see the pain through a Levinasian framework or through intersubjectivity. When you talk to your friend about your pain, you say, it hurts, it feels like it's stabbing, ripping. You're not thinking in terms of empathy. So I have an alternative way to frame pain. And the alternative way that I personally frame What do I mean by narrative? I mean that the person in pain has pain, has a symptom, but it should always be interpreted in the context of their lives. Already, I've lifted myself out of looking at pain as burning, stabbing, ripping, and I've looked at the effect that it has had on the person. Looking at pain in terms of narrative means that the person in pain needs to be recognized as having pain, but that the meaning for them is that they are in pain, and the meaning for them is that they have it. If you have pain, that fact is fundamentally meaning, meaningful for you. That you have pain can have several effects upon your life. That suggests that it can have several meanings. That that pain has effects on your life means that it can have effects on the lives of others. So already, we're talking about several orders of magnitude of narrative. The, so I, I just want to draw our attention today to the fact that we're all in this pain predicament together. We're all in the same boat. We're all locked in cultural model which suggests that pain can only be expressed in negative terms. Now, if I wanted to be scientific for a moment, for those who are inclined in the audience to speak this language, I could talk about mirror neurons and wave my hands and bring that up. But what I'd rather do is go along a parallel track. I'd like to suggest that, imagine if you will, a person in pain. How do you know that they are in it's an interesting little experiment. Well, you can tell by their body language. You can tell by their facial expressions. You can tell by their tone of voice. By recognizing these things, you can then enter into their experience. You can empathically respond to the person in pain. I don't mean to suggest to anyone that pain is a positive I don't mean to suggest that pain is a good thing to have. All I'm here to suggest today is that pain is a not necessarily negative thing to have. And by looking upon it that way, we've freed ourselves, I think, a little bit from only looking at pain in terms of weapons and damage. Now, there has been research done, which has looked at functional fMRI responses, functional MRI responses to people um, who are shown pictures of 
we know in the brain where this works. We've done electromyographic studies on people who have blood pain and we measure facial response and muscle twitches and the response of the person who's watching. We have science for this. But really, what we have in the clinic is we have narrative to listen to people um, describe their pain, but also to put it into a context and formulate it into a narrative. So if you followed me this far, if you buy what I'm saying, then we've left the clinical, apocalyptic, mechanistic hell that is, in some respects, some element of modern medicine. We've left a huge amount of infusion of money into pharmacology looking for the way the pain pathway works, looking for a perfect magic bullet, again, weapon, weapon metaphor. We've, we've left that, we've left the hell, and we've gone into a zone, let's say, of recovery, a more positive zone where we can look at pain as not necessarily negative. But I still would suggest, despite Levinasian philosophy, despite intersubjectivity, despite my essay at narrative, I still suggest we have a fundamental problem at the level of metaphor. That's our problem. That's how we talk to one another. And we need to fix that. And so, by the power invested in me, by FedEx and uh, poetry, I, I command all the poets who are listening to me here to work on this problem of metaphor, to try and invent more positive metaphors for the expression of pain. And I'll conclude by saying that the problem that we have with pain is not pharmacological or based in intervention. It's definitional. The problem is really metaphors. And I hope we can all work together to, to fix that.